good to see everybody this morning. Our lesson this morning is, How Can I Build Up the Blue Springs Congregation? Now, let me tell you what this sermon isn't. This sermon isn't pointing the finger at you and say, You better do better. You better do this. Make sure this is taking place in your life. This isn't a, a, a sermon to scold people. Really, it's just the opposite, to encourage people. So that together we use our strengths and our talents to strengthen the Blue Springs congregation. So uh, I want you to keep that in mind as we work our way through these suggestions that each one of us can do. Turn over in your Bible, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And beginning there in verse 25, Paul's going to talk about the church. And Paul, if, if you keep going backward in this, you see that Paul um, talks about the church a great deal. And he, uh, he uh, exalts the church. And he talks about all the blessings that come from being members in the church. So Paul is pro-church. There's no doubt about that. And Paul says, beginning in verse 25, he says, "...there should be no schism in the body." but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. The reason why I begin there is because Paul gives us the understanding that your place in the church is important. See? That the talents that you bring to the church, your talents are important. That the works that you're able to do, well, the works that you're carrying out right now, those things are important. It's been said, and I believe it to be true, that a congregation is only as strong as its weakest link. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be that link. <laughs> I don't want to be that person that instead of building up the congregation that I'm part of, makes it weaker. And in some ways, causes it harm. So when we talk about what we can do as individuals to build up our congregation, it's pretty important. So we have to give careful consideration to that. Well, what can we do? What can I do to build up the Blue Springs Church of Christ? Well, here's the first one. As a member, I must attend my congregation to build it up. Uh, attendance is more than us just saying, um, we've got to make sure we get that number on the board over there as high as we possibly can get it. That's not the purpose of attendance. Okay? The purpose of attendance is for the church to come together on the first day of the week. To uh, come together, to study the Word of God together, to worship together. Um, go over to Hebrews chapter 10. Um, uh, uh, these verses aren't going to catch you by surprise. Hebrews chapter 10, and instead of beginning in verse 25, let's begin in verse 24. And uh, the author of Hebrews says these words. He says, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Now, why do we consider one another? Well, we just saw what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that we're the body of Christ, so we need to encourage one another. We need to stir up one another. We already said and saw in 1 Corinthians 12 that when one member suffers, we all suffer. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. So it should be no surprise to us that when we get here to verse 24, that we're to stir one another up that we're to be there and support one another. So it says this to, to, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I know verse 25 is probably just seared into your brain, and it's a good verse to have there. But I want you to notice that Paul is very careful, uh, the author of Hebrews is very careful here what he says. And he says, but exhorting one another. Now, those who think, and, and you, you know, um, I was talking, I think it was last week, about the top 11 congregations, you know, and how not one of them was faithful. Um, I think when we look at the things here in verse 25, that we see the importance of having, um, that being there when the church gathers to worship. And in those congregations, in those ten, you would have uh, membership, and then you would have adherence. So the membership might rest around 100, and the adherence might be 300. So somewhere along the line, you know, there's 200 more people who say, yeah, that's my congregation, but they don't go. You see, it's important for us to be faithful in our attendance because of what we're doing. And in verse 25, when we assemble ourselves together, 
but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I need you to exhort me. I need you to encourage me. And those around you need the exact same thing. Does attendance matter? Sure it does. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we should follow the example that's there. Paul waits to assemble with the church. And he comes together on the first day of the week. Does it matter if I'm here on the first day of the week? Well, sure it matters. It matters so much to Paul that he waited. But here's the third thing. I need to do my part to come together. Let me give you a condensed version here of each of those verses with one word. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 17, you know what it says? It says come together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and verse 18, you know what it says? It says come together. In 1 Corinthians chapter 18, and verse 20, it says come together. Or uh, verse 11, come together. In verse 23, it says come together. In 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 23, it says come together. In verse 26, this is going to not be a big surprise to you. You know what it says? Come together. Now there has to be a reason why Paul is stressing that fact. And it really doesn't surprise me because here's a man who waited to assemble with the saints on the first day of the week. It doesn't surprise me that he's then telling the church in Corinth, listen, you need to come together. Y'all need to be there when the assembly takes place. Now, if that was important for them in the first century, isn't it important for us in the 21st century? What do we need to do? I can build up my congregation when I attend it up. Here's number two. As a member, I must pray for my congregation to build it up. I, we can never underestimate the power of prayer. Brethren, there is not a single doubt, in my, not one doubt in my mind whatsoever that when I pray or you pray, that God hears our prayers. There is no doubt whatsoever in my mind. So think about that. The times that you are going in prayer to God, He's listening to the very words that you're saying. He hears them. He gives them great consideration. And I think that's important when we talk about being a people of prayer because we know how it helps our relationship with God. If you go over to Acts chapter 2, go over to Acts chapter 2, and um, go over to verse 42. Acts 2 and verse 42. And this is giving us a description of what the first century church did. In fact, the first congregation. And it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. Prayers. So clearly when it came to the actions of the first century church, they didn't say, well, you know what, if we get around to it, we'll just tack a prayer on. Right? They're not the people who are saying, well, you know what? Things are running a little long today. You know, that preacher was so long-winded. I tell you what, let's just not pray. Well, that's not an option. We have to be people that pray to build up the congregation. Um, go over to Luke chapter 18. you got to turn backward in your Bible. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. And um, it says this, uh, Jesus is the one. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Now you can keep reading down and to see what Jesus said, but there's the encouragement from Jesus himself. We need to pray. It needs to be part of who we are, and we need to be praying for our congregation. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want you to look at verse 17. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17 says this, Pray, three words, pray without ceasing. Now I can't remember what translation it is, but there's a translate, translation out there that says pray continually. Just two words. Who would have thought in three words or two words that we could be instructed in so much? So important. How many times should I pray? Well, without ceasing. Should I make prayer important? My important my, well, it says without ceasing. Is there a limit to how many times I should pray? It says without ceasing. The church is, is run on the fuel of prayer. It, it keeps us going. Here's another one. I need to make sure it is part of my worship. Ephesians 5.19 and Colossians 3 and verse 16 tell us that we need to be a people who give ourselves. Well, those are dealing with music. I'm sorry. Those are dealing with music. 
prayer, I think, of Paul in the, um, in the jail um, where Paul and uh, Silas were praying at night and singing songs to the Lord. I think that's important. You go on again and you see Paul as he writes to other congregations saying what? Saying, pray for us. And we're praying for you. It's important that we're a people of prayer. Here's the third thing. As a member, I must talk up my congregation to build it up. Right? I must talk it up. We talk about a lot of things. And we build up a lot of things. My brother Robert uh, is a huge uh, Royals fan. Um, and I'm a huge Cleveland Indian fan because we know God loves Cleveland Indians. So, um, it's the way it is. But there is, both him and I talk up our team. The Rob talks up his teams, the Royals, and he's like, I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I talk up the Cleveland Indians. There's lots of things that we talk up. There's lots of things that say they're important to me. If, I, if you and I are ever on our own and we're talking one-on-one and I begin to bring up a book, just say, I'm sorry, Brother Gales, i I, I got to go home and you know, skin the chicken, fry it up, and have it ready. Uh, because I, I love to talk about books. I love to build up people so that they'll desire a love for books. Well, if we can build up all of those things, certainly we can talk up the church because that builds it up. Um, telling other about Jesus uh, needs to be a must, not a maybe. Go over to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. And I want you to notice this in verse 42. It's the last, last verse in that chapter. It says again, And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So more than just that day of Pentecost. It's not a one-off. It's not Peter getting up there and saying, Well, let me tell you about Jesus. And then no other, that He's the Christ. He's the Messiah. And then it just falls away from their preaching. That's not how it works. It became that cornerstone. What? Let me tell you about Jesus. What? Do you know who Jesus is? What? Have you have you heard about who Jesus is? What? Do you know what Jesus did for us? What? 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 It gives us an opportunity to build up our congregation. Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 is a very uh, key passage in all of the New Testament. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 4, it's not a good time for the church. Paul is wreaking havoc on the church. He's dragging people away, putting them in prison, you know, leading to a death sentence. I mean, he got Paul loved God, but Paul didn't love Christ or his church. So persecu- persecution takes place, and it says this, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the Word. Now how in the world can, can we say that we're talking up the church if we're not teaching the Word. There's no way. You can't separate Scripture from our congregation. You can't talk separate Scripture from our need to build up the congregation. I mean, I like the, day, the, the weekly Scripture verse that we read. I like that that's part of our worship. I like that we're able, uh, not just in our singing, um, but in our Bible classes and the lessons that come from this pulpit, I'm glad that we talk up the congregation, that we build it up with Scripture. It's vital. It's vital. Um, go over to Matthew, or excuse me, Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16. And this is the, the, towards the very end. Uh, Mark chapter 16. Look at verse 15. And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Listen, we need to talk it up. We need to go into all the world and talk about the wonderful things that happen, not just in our congregation, but the wonderful things that we know about Christianity. Let let, let me ask you this. If we're not talking up our congregation, who's going to do it? Right? We're, We're the members here. If there's anybody that needs to be talking up our congregation, how can it not be us? I mean, we have to do it. 
I'm not talking about being a narcissist. I'm not talking about being full of ourselves. I'm talking about saying, listen, our congregation is a sound congregation. Our congregation is faithful to the Word of God. Talking it up. Letting people know, hey, if you want to experience New Testament worship, why don't you come on down and and join us? Hey, if you want to hear God's Word, come down and join us. You know, If you want to grow, come down and join us. If you want to see what New Testament worship looks at, we're going to be worshiping at 10.30 on Sunday. Come on down with us. We talk up the congregation. We let others know the wonderful things that are taking place in our congregation. Again, if we don't talk it up, who's going to do it? Here's number four. As a member, I must work with my congregation to build it up. Um, There's no retirement age when it comes to being a Christian. I know we slow down. I know that health gets in the way. I know that we wrestle with difficulties. I know people get too old to live on their own, to walk on their own, to eat on their own. That happens. And and I'm not trying to belittle those who have reached a point where they're not able to do that, to to be present or to door knock or whatever we may think of. But we have to understand that as as long as we're alive, um, being a Christian is absolutely essential to us and doing whatever work we can is important. We need to work for our congregation. Um, go over to James chapter 2 and verse 18. James 2 and verse 18. James 2 and verse 18. So James is dealing with this concept of faith and works. And so in verse 18 it says this, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. So here's the reasoning that James uses. He says, show me your faith without your works. You know, let me see your, okay, let, let me see your faith. What, go ahead, any minute now. Let me, go ahead, I'll, I'll give you another, go ahead. Show me your faith. Uh, show me your work. Can't do it. And he says this, I will show you my faith by my work. You want to see if I believe it's important to preach the gospel? I'm going here today. And last week I went there. You want to see if I'm faithful? Look at the works that I'm doing. You want to see if I'm faithful? Look at how I interact with the congregation that I'm part of. Look how I try to build up the congregation that I'm part of. You want to see my faith? My faith is being demonstrated for every single person to see. For every single person to know. And it's a true statement. You know, that's the way in which our faith is manifest. Now, I know not everybody believes. I know that there's people out there who say, well, I don't care what you do. I'm not going to believe. I understand that. But we don't let that discourage us. I mean, we shouldn't. We have to keep going. Manifesting our faith is important for us to build up our congregation. We have to work it up. Here's number five. As a member, I must love my congregation to build it up. L- love is a very important thing. And love is expressed in many different ways. Love is expressed verbally. I love you. I I love that we're together. I love all the things that we do. I love butterflies. I love this. I love that. We express love verbally. We express love physically. I want to give you a hug. You know, I I, I want to be with you. I want to be around you. I I, I want us to to do things together. It's physical, right? And and love is even spiritual. I have love in my heart for you. I've been praying for you. I know you're going through a difficult time, but I love you. Right? It's going to be expressed in a spiritual sense. When it comes to building up our congregation, we understand that we have to be manifesting love. Go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. And... um, Go down beginning in verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 13. It says, Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against his brother, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now I know it goes on, but that's where we want to look. And if you go back beginning in verse 13, after you read verse 14, then you know what an application of love is, right? Bearing with one another. We do that because we love one another. And we see it in verse 14, right? Forgiving one another. We do that because we love one another. You see that in verse 14, right? If we have a complaint, we deal with it. We try to settle it. Why? Because we love one another. 
because Christ, uh, because Christ forgave us, we forgive others because we love one another. It's very important. How can we build up Blue Springs if we're not having love for one another? Right? How can we do that? Well, it's just not possible. Um, go over, if you will, or turn forward to First Peter. First Peter, chapter four, and look at verse eight. As a member, I must love my congregation to build it up. Well, my love must be fervent for my fellow Christians. Peter says this, Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover over, uh, will cover a multitude of sins. Now, I know there's different levels of love. Uh, you know, different levels. Um, the level here is set for us. We don't get to choose. And when Peter is writing about it in the context of love, he says fervent. Now, there's nothing casual about being fervent. There is nothing ah, kind of optional about, about being fervent. It is with everything we have. It is that desire. It's that goal. It's the fuel in our engine that keeps it going when we talk about loving one another. Our congregation is built up when that fervency is placed among the membership. When we have that opportunity to love one another, how can the congregation not be built up? When we have that love, how can the congregation not become stronger? Well, naturally it will. Number six, as a member, I must support my congregation to build it up. Um, not, not building like we looked at before, supporting in the sense of what do I give to continue the work here. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and uh, look at verse 7. Verse 7. It says this, so let, each one, oh, so let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Well, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say to you, you have to give 10%, because that was an Old Testament principle. So I'm not going to say it. And here's another thing. I'm not going to say how much you as an individual have purpose in your heart to give. It's none of my business. You give what you want to give. It's that simple, right? It's, it's based, it's you, um, it's what you are doing to help financially support the congregation, okay? So I'm not going to set any rules or regulations because the Bible does it. It says give as you purpose. It says give cheerfully. Not with, oh, I really don't want to give you know, this money, but I'm going to do it anyway. No, hold on to your money. Because that's not being give cheerfully. I also know that heaven's not run on a budget. I know that heaven doesn't need money. But the church is run on a budget. Right? And, and the church does need money. I think sometimes we dance around that. If we don't have the funds to continue our works, well, they stop. If we don't have the funds to pay the utility bill, it stops. So we see the importance of being individuals who say, listen, I, I need to support my congregation to help build it up. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And I give you verse 2. We might back up to verse 1. And Paul is on his way. Uh, he's going to be to Corinth, and he says this, On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. Now, I clearly understand that the, uh, the immediate context of this is Paul saying to Corinth, Hey, I'm going to be on my way. Instead of we have to wait gathering all this collection up, why don't you talk to the brethren, have them gather the collection up, so when I come, we don't have to spend time doing that. I understand Paul's coming to get it, right? He, he, that there's a specific purpose for it. But I also see a principle in there that applies to us because it goes hand in hand with 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7. It says, Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper. Again, you decide what it is. You make that decision. It's not anybody else's business. Nobody else has to say, I approve or disapprove of it. It's between you and God. But please know, I, people hate it when you talk about money from the pulpit. They do. But here's what I know, brethren. We can't do the things that we're doing here in Blue Springs if we're not giving to build our congregation up. 
And here's number seven. Here's number seven. As a member, I must defend my congregation to build it up. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details about this, but I was probably here two weeks, and I was visiting with some folks, and some derogatory things were said about our congregation to me. And i got to be honest with you, it it caught me by surprise. Um, Now, if you don't know this, this is true, preachers are pick at one another constantly. Oh, I could have done a better job on that sermon. Oh, can you believe that he interpreted that scripture? It's it's a it's something that happens. Okay? Something that happens. But I was really surprised what was said. So I bring I brought it back to the men. And I said, Hey guys, this is what was said firsthand. It was said to me and and I want to bring it to you all. And I will tell you that every single one of those men stood in defense of this congregation. Every single one of them. Some of it was, you know what, maybe we need to take two or three of us and we need to go visit with these people individually because of what they said. And maybe that's what we need to do. That's defending the congregation that you are part of. You're part of the Blue Springs Church of Christ. And it's so important to defend us. If you hear something derogatory about the congregation, deal with it right then and there. Right? Don't wait. Don't wait for it to settle down. Deal with it right in the moment in which it occurred. Let me give you some examples. Um, Go over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 15. And what I want you to remember about this passage is that the apostles and the elders at the church here um, are defending the church over things that have been said. Okay, They're defending it. It says this, and when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received Paul and Barnabas. They were received by the church, uh, and the and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, "It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses." So here's what these people were teaching. They said, okay, you want to be a Christian? That's great. But here's what you need to do. You need to obey the Old Testament law first. Then you can become a Christian. See, circumcision was the outward sign that one belonged to God. It's that simple. That's why it was done. So here you have them saying, you have to obey the law. Now, the church didn't say that. Paul and Barnabas didn't say that. Go down beginning there in verse 6. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Do we need to teach that you have to obey the law to become a Christian? It says this, and when there had been much dispute. Dispute about what? Requiring the Old Testament obligations to be placed upon New Testament people as an obligation for them. And after there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to the men, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel. Why does he begin with the Gentiles? Because these are the Gentiles that are coming into the church. And of course they didn't obey the law. And of course they weren't circumcised. Drop on down to 22. To 22. So they meet, they decide the issue, and then they say this. It says, then it pleased the, uh, verse 22, then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who was also named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. They wrote this letter. Okay? They wrote this letter by them the apostles, the elders, and the brethren, the church, to the brethren who are uh, of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us have troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment, it seemed good to us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. Right? So it seemed good by the Holy Spirit to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, 
that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. That's a defense of the church. That's the elders. It's the apostles. See, even apostles upheld the importance of having an eldership in a congregation because they included the eldership in dealing with this. And they included the congregation. That's the brethren. And so they said, we have to defend the church. This thing is going around saying that you need to obey the law. We're not going to let that go. We're not going to sweep it under the rug. Barnabas, hey, Paul, listen. You go down there and correct this issue. Here's a letter. We need to do the same thing in order to build up our congregation. We need to be people who, when called upon, are willing to defend it. I know it's not always pleasant. I know sometimes it can be nerve-wracking, but we have to do it. I'll say this again. I'll say this again. If the membership here doesn't defend our congregation, then you tell me who will. Right? I don't want people who are members at other congregations defending the work that we're doing. I want us as members of the Blue Springs Church of Christ to defend our works, to, to defend our practices, to defend our way of worship, right? The membership needs to step forward. I'll give you one more. Go over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Man, I love hearing you all turn pages in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 4. It says this, Paul is talking, you know the situation, there's a brother involved in an immoral situation. Paul says this, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Look, Paul says to the Corinthians, you need to defend your congregation. There is something going on in your congregation that the members need to rise up and deal with, right? Because we're talking there, number seven, I'm, to, to help my ch- congregation be built up, I've got to defend it. So Paul says, defend it. Paul says, you brother need to step forward and deal with what's going on here. Why? Because if the membership doesn't defend its own congregation, then who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Look, I make this short little comment there at the end of the outline under conclusion. If you as a member don't build up the Blue Springs congregation, there will be no one. There will be no one to make sure that our congregation, that this congregation will remain strong and faithful. Strong and faithful. How can I build up the Blue Springs congregation? Why don't you let these seven things be a starting place for you? Listen, we're going to extend the song of invitation this morning. If we can help you or encourage you in any way, we'd like to do that. If you are here and you're not a member of the Lord's Church, well, you need to be. (laughs) You need to be added to the church by God. Acts 2, verse 47. The gospel plan of salvation is simple. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you haven't done that, well, then why not do it today, right now? Let's stand as we sing.